welcome to this episode of the Down the Put Podcast. Uh, we won. We fucking won. So uh, <laughs> we, we didn't do a pod last week because I had dropsy, but uh, I just think that uh, I think we we're just a little bit fatigued last week. I think I think it was just uh, yeah. I just. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it was, but uh, yeah, I was so fucking happy. It was like the perfect result, not the perfect game, obviously, uh, Rampy. Uh, but um, yeah, everything else was fell into place. Um, so yeah, how are you, lads, Dion? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think it's any coincidence. We, we all seem to have miraculously covered, recovered from all of these ailments <laughs> when we finally win again. <laughs> Shocking coincidence. That. I know, I know, it's crazy. Uh, so yeah, so I thought we just kind of, Get into uh, probably why we thought that we won. I guess a um, couple of like little things. Um, uh, I just want to kind of get your thoughts on because I remember just before it, we were kind of asking who was going to be playing in the ten role, and um, I, I when we said it was Jeremy, I I must admit I was just like, oh for fuck's sakes! But I actually thought it worked really well because we actually were able to press uh, forward up the pitch, and I think that that's put a lot of pressure on their back line. So I just wanted to uh, get your your thoughts, uh, Gary, on Jeremy as a 10 and what it meant for our formation. I I, th- I thought he was a 10 when I first started watching, but I, I don't... I, I think it was more of a diamond midfield, actually, than him being a straight-up 10. I thought that diamond was rampy sitting at the base, Lorenzo to his right a bit further forward, Jeremy to his left a bit further forward, and then Telford dropping right back from striker to be the tip of the diamond. And then um, Bayer and Ferrin being our most advanced players and spinning in behind. Um, so it, I, I think it was more that diamond than the box midfield that we're we're a bit more used to. But Jeremy was good. I, I like him in a slightly more advanced position and, and where he was. He wasn't spending too much time centrally, but he was in that that left half space and the thing you get with him is is pretty good ball progression but he's also he's also one of the players we've got and we haven't got that many of them who are really strong in duels as well and he was getting his foot in and getting stuck in which was which was nice to see in terms of pressing it it tended to be him and he was the one that joined up with Telfer to press as a two I, I I don't think we changed that much because I still don't think we were aggressively pressing I think it was more still sitting in a mid block don't really press their goalkeeper but as soon as the ball makes its way into that that lone six they had or one of the midfielders then we smash them then we press them really aggressively at that point the the only times we didn't do that was you'd see, you'd see Telford kind of looking for their six because he wanted to sit on their six when they were building and when he managed to kind of lock in on the six that would be a trigger for Jeremy and um, Jeremy and By- Clement Bayer um, to press their two centre backs. So then, if the keeper had the ball, two centre backs getting pressed, six getting pressed, so they had to go long. But that 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 didn't always happen. That was just something we occasionally lent into. But yeah, overall, diamond midfield, slightly different look, and worked fabulously. Yeah, I thought like uh, you know. Compared to like an awful lot of the games we played this season, we did cause quite a, like a, a a good few turnovers, a couple of mistakes because I don't think we've really seen us like uh, pressuring the the back line. We kind of tend to sit like a little bit kind of deeper and uh, as you said, pressure the uh, the sixes and stuff like that. But I thought it was it was kind of a nice change, and it, we we're kind of panicking them into um uh, into making mistakes, and I think that. Uh, it probably wasn't something that they expected to be honest with you, and I think it kind of caught them by surprise because we were straight up the gates like getting into their faces and uh c- c- causing chaos you know so um, i think i think what we did we went we went man to man over a lot of the pitch and i i th- we i don't think we always go man to man in games that we but we like to do it sometimes and i thought josh of wanderer's notebook really made made a really good comment in his article last week about um how many jewels we lost in the last game and after he said that i was thinking like Okay, we're a team who on the ball have a lot of floaty, soft-footed tens, which is great when you're in possession. But if you are then going man-to-man off the ball, you need dual monsters and you need players who can win the duels because man-to-man is essentially every time the ball is free, it's a scrap between the player you're marking who can win it. 
And by losing a lot of duels in the last game, we weren't really winning that battle. Um, but I thought on on Sunday, we weren't only good in possession, our duels were there as well. We won our duels and that made all the difference in the end. Yeah, uh, Chris, we had like, what, four four wanderers in the uh, the team of the week, uh, which was pretty uh, pretty good thing. But also, I, I think it's to be expected considering the result. But I was surprised that uh, Boya wasn't actually in that um that that lineup but um what difference has he made to us since he's come in you know we kind of touched on it a little bit before but um this was like, like probably his guest best game so far and what kind of like options does he give us uh when he's when he's playing just an energy you know uh it's such a cliche term but i've talked about it this first two months of the season so so much where matching the energy is important um i Beg to say in the very early days, this might be one of Matt Fegan's best moves ever. I was very vocal uh, about how much it sucked to lose Thomas Geraldo just because of how well he played last year and how key he was last year. But as we've seen continuously through the weeks, his role and his type of player doesn't necessarily fit in this system. What Clem has brought is exactly what I think Patrice was missing in the first few weeks of the season. Um, it's not minimally documented i think it's pretty well known by our fan base that the early season struggles was a lot of patrice trying to fit square pegs and round holes playing ryan telfer all over the field trying to figure out the right combinations and one of the things that i think we were missing at the beginning and and gary was a huge trumpeter of this was we needed to fit massimo farron doing what he did last year and that's come to fruition and we needed something on the right side of the field to help zach and not only has this helped zach but it's also unlocked something in the midfield we haven't seen this year so far. And it's clearly and obviously unlocked something up front where, you know, there's still a debate whether or not Telfer should be our lead hand, but he's making Telfer look good by creating these spaces and creating these propositions. Gary brought it up in the previous segment about Telfer finding the six, the Vancouver backs, the their left back and their center back, they were panicking almost to an extent because they knew that if they pressed on Telfer, Clem is getting behind on a one-on-one. And then if they press Clem, well, Telfer, for all his criticisms so far this year, what he's improved on with his fitness, I think, and it goes hand in hand for me. As the as time has gone on, he's clearly become more match fit and physically fit. He's able to turn on a dime. It's it's almost it almost doesn't make any sense because it's a and it's acceleration and an agility that shorter players have. He's a tall, lanky guy, but he finds that turn so quickly. And I think what Clem has done is he's actually unlocked everybody else by creating that space and by being that danger that we haven't had so far this season. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I think you're right spot on there with uh, Zach Fernandez. He just looks a different player having somebody alongside him that he's able to uh, to kind of trust. And he he doesn't have to always be the one that's trying to attack down the right. It's kind of giving him a little bit of breathing space. I think he's definitely uh, improved the last couple of games. Uh, Gary, you got something to say there? Yeah, just to, I want to piggyback on something Chris said then because it was so spot on about how Telford doing what Telford does is creating space for Clem and vice versa as well because Telford was really dropping deep in this game. I, I wouldn't go as, as far as saying he was playing as a false nine, but he was dropping into midfield a lot. And what happens when he does that is he drags the defender with him. And if we've got Clem and Bayer on the right wing, who is lightning fast, great movement, you draw that defender with you and suddenly there's a space for him to run into and he exploited that a lot. And even I even thought he was kind of almost playing as a second striker sometimes as well when Zach was overlapping on the right because Zach wants to be in that right channel. So Clem moves in a lane, joins up with Telfer as a second striker and they kind of dovetail really nicely. So yeah, I think it's um, beginnings of a really positive partnership there. So I guess this kind of begs the question there because obviously Telfer is on a bit of a, a scoring streak, I guess. Um, so it's just like, like obviously Coyne is out injured, but when he comes back into the team, do you see, do you see Telfer being our starting nine now? Or how do you see him adapting as a team if Coyne comes back in? I, I, I do, yeah. I think I've watched Telfer play as a nine for us the last few games and for sorry, the last few games that he's played as a nine for us and thought like, how how has his career been mismanaged so badly where he's been stuck out on the wing? You look at his physical profile and the type of athlete he is, I don't see a winger anymore. He's he's kind of like his stocky, lower body strength. He can back his ass in. Like he's the kind of player you want playing back to goal, I think. And 
what surprised me with him is his ability to flick the ball around the corner, his ability to like post up and lay off. I didn't, I didn't think he had that in him. Honestly, I thought, I thought he was just kind of a semi pacey winger who liked to cut in onto his left foot. And I think I've read him completely wrong. And I think a lot of his former coaches have read him wrong as well, because I haven't seen him played as a straight up nine too often, but everything I'm seeing right now, that's, that's his position. He's a decent finisher. He holds up well, he can pull out to the wide areas if we want to do some rotations. And yeah, I'd, I'd start him uh, until this purple patch is over. I'd just keep starting him. So, uh, Chris, uh, just, just to kind of bring you in on that one, like, you know, uh, we, we kind of mentioned before, I think, about his hold of play being like excellent. But I mean, uh, I think the finishing side of it has been uh, a big, a big plus too. So, what are your thoughts on him? And what does this mean for Climate? Because, like, uh, I know we said we wouldn't talk about this subject, but obviously we have to because we need under 21 minutes, right? So, and Coimbra is, well, Coimbra is our man that we need to, he's the one that's going to get chosen to bring them in. So what, what do you think this means overall for us? Like we're, Telfer fits in, Coimbra fits in, or do we just start depending on uh, Baskin Sells to bring them in for us? Well, I think Gary echoed what I was thinking internally you keep Telfer in there until the form falls off. I think with our goal scoring issues, it would be crazy not to. That was Massimo Farron last year, you know, not necessarily naturally a striker, but became kind of a forward that found himself in those goal scoring opportunities. His confidence built as the season went. Telfer's actually finding that peak earlier than Farron did last year. So it's hopeful in that sense. And it potentially fixes an issue. You know, we maybe we'll talk about this in a little bit, but we're in a bit of a, near crisis mode with defense and with the transfer window opening soon, I think that needs to be Matt's priority. Um, Telfer finding this form as a striker is almost like a new signing in a weird way, because again, Patrice was trying to just fit him in the system. And like Gary said, not a lot of us have seen Telfer play in this role, especially in Miami where he was an out and out winger. Um, When he was an MLS next pro, he kind of went between that left forward striker position, but he wasn't in great form. Uh, he, he played decent, but he didn't show that goal scoring prowess, which to answer the other part of your bit there, Anthony, his finishing has improved. Um, some of his misses earlier in the season were a bit comical to an extent, but we we've spoken about how, OK, at least he's getting in those positions. Once he finally gets the finishing touch in, there's going to be a different player here to unlock and he's finding that. So, uh, you know, even during this game, there was an opportunity right before he scored the first goal where. It's that confidence on his weak foot. He just doesn't quite have it in stride. And that showed up in that first opportunity where it should have been a finish, an easy finish, but, you know, it was kind of a fluff. But instead of him taking a step back and not putting himself in that position to score, which is what we've seen earlier in the year, he has that miss. And then maybe his head gets down, his confidence is down. And again, maybe his fitness wasn't 100%. We're seeing kind of that 100% tell for now. Shit, I missed that last one. I'm going to go back and get this one. And we've seen it over the last few weeks, even it, with him taking a foul, you know, that aggression is still there. And we've talked about how Coimbra, he's kind of like that bull in a China shop. You kind of want that one person to press, but you don't want the lungs to run out. Telfer is now starting to show that energy. You know, people have rightfully or wrongfully called him lazy over the last couple of months. But I'd say over the last couple of weeks, he's completely dispelled that uh, notion as far as I'm concerned. Um, what does it mean for Coimbra? I, I do honestly believe in, and the under 21 minutes is a big part of it, Anthony. He has to stay in some kind of rotation, even if it's off the bench, in an off the bench situation. If you need to keep Telfer on the field, that's when you shift him wide. Um, it, it's not necessarily beneficial to have him in those positions when his legs might be a little bit tired, but it at least keeps that form on the field. And, and he's also shown that he's got the playmaking ability um, of, of a stud as well, which surprised me. Um, when he's playing on the wings, he's a, a cut in and shoot or cut out and cross kind of player. What he's shown this year is he can actually get into those intricate spaces, play one twos, little touch offs between the legs kind of plays back heels. He's got it all. And, and it's been a surprise. We've been uh, privileged to watch him play for the last, what, four or five, six years in this league, outside of this league. We've seen the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, but it feels like the good is definitely here to stay. So, uh, you know, it does not bode well, I think, for Coimbra in terms of getting minutes. And with those under 21 minutes, yeah, Camillo has to be the big one. Um, in referencing our potential defensive crisis, I think that this might be 
uh, as good an opportunity as ever for Patrice to give Gavis a few minutes. Um, with Zach being out, we know Ferrazzo took a knock uh, towards the end of the Vancouver game. We don't know his status. I'm assuming Dunn's not going to play. And Dan Nimick is just getting back into match fitness. So this could be an opportunity to maybe take a couple of minutes off of that tally. But um, I know that you guys, uh, <laughs> you tiptoed the subject last yeah. year when I was listening. And I know we didn't really want to get into it this year, but it's now starting to rear its head. And I think, you know, I, I mentioned in the chat, Fillion is a card away. Um, so we might see rushness 90 minutes there. You know, if it's even just chipping away every match, we have to do it. And I think that's why Coimbra definitely stays in the mix. I, uh, I must say, uh, um, I just loved, uh, how nonchalant his celebration was, uh, as part of, he just looks so fucking cool. Like you score a goal and then you just like chewing some gum and just, he reminded me of Cantona with the first one. Yeah, it was fucking it was awesome. Very I, Cantona. I love that shit. Like, you know, I as much as I love people like doing crazy celebrations and you see Willie Akio doing the flips and stuff like that, something like that is just like, what's all the fuss about? You know, I'm just mm-hmm. doing my job, you know? So I kind of like that. So, you know, uh, uh, Chris touched upon there about the, some of the injuries that we got. Like, you know, as much as this was a great win, we've, we've kind of come... Uh, we we have a bit of a casualty list, and then also uh, like Rampy's probably going to see what like a, a two or three game ban, I guess two game. Um, but Duns one looked pretty bad. Um, you know, like it was just when when you see like a non contact injury like that and just kind of falling over, and you're kind of just thinking like, did you slip? That's kind of what it looked like. But then um, a, a friend of mine saw him, uh, saw the team in Calgary Airport, and he was in a wheelchair with crutches, which is never a good sign. So, Gary, what kind of ramifications does this have for our team? Because, you know, if, God forbid, like, you know, as Chris said, Nimick's just coming back, and you kind of don't want to be pushing him straight into, you know, he, he, he was fantastic when he came on in this game, but you, know, you kind of want to make sure he's being eased back in as well. So what do we do if... Uh, if the worst comes to the worst, <laughs> where, where, where do you see those uh, changing systems or players to come in, or what? What way will we fix it? Well, you, I mean, we definitely need bodies in defence. We need to bring someone in in the in the summer transfer window, without a doubt. I'd say you're right. The Julian Dunn one did look worrying to me. Um, anytime it's non-contact, you you worry a little bit, especially with a player like him who missed a year and a half, two years of football because of a very serious injury. I don't think for a minute it was a reoccurrence of that, but we all know when players come back from ACLs or MCLs or whatever, they tend to pick up a lot of a lot of injuries like that because yep. maybe they've overcompensated one leg during their recovery. Um, maybe they're kind of still learning how to move again and just these things happen so there's no surprise I feel like we probably said that in one of the preview pods that something like this would probably happen at some point in the season you just hope it isn't serious enough for him to miss months rather than weeks but we'll wait to see what Patrice does or more likely does not say at the press conference because I think yeah. he tends to keep injuries quite close to the chest um, luckily Dan's back Dan and Kale. They basically got through the whole season last year, just the two of them without getting injured, um, which was pretty miraculous. And I feel like we're going to have to rely on them to put in some serious minutes again because, yeah, Dunn looks like he's going to be out for a little while. Kareem, so who knows what's going on with him? It doesn't look good, though. I mean... He's he he seems to be getting rolled out for all the community events at the minute, which is normally, <laughs> which is normally like... a bit of a sign, isn't it? <laughs> like every, uh, I feel like every single thing they've done in my home bay over the past six months, he's been present for. So. Oh, they yeah. actually bought they, they rented him a place out there. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know what's got. Like, hopefully he's back soon because I I've sorry, Chris, gone. No, I was just gonna say on that topic. I believe this week is the big one. Um, after the game, I got to talk to him for a minute. You, you know, he doesn't want to talk details, and I don't blame him. Um, but I think that there's a big, a big test or a scan or some kind of review this week. Um, hopefully, that bears good news, and then that would be a huge boost to the issue. But um, yeah, that a big question mark, I think, because that cures two issues with Jeremy. You know, he took a knock. We don't know his full situation. He's a left back option. Wesley has been kind of this left center back. He hasn't been up and down the flank the last few weeks. So like, I, and I want you to continue Gary, because I'm curious where you're going with this next, but 
to Anthony's question, like, what is Patrice going to do? Is he going to just keep it like a flat back four the way it's been, or is he going to try to get sexy and creative with things? Mm, yeah, I, who knows? I mean, I, I, I really want Kareem so back because I think he's tailor made for the Wes Timoteo position, what he does there. And then you can use Wes in other areas of the pitch. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, we've got two fit centre-backs at the end of the day. And I think the emergency, emergency centre-back would be Rampy, and he's out for the next two games as well. So you just got to kind of keep everything cross that, that, that Kale and Dan stay fit. And, and if not, Geordie, have Geordie, a... Geordie or Jed or Patrice are going to have to probably slip does in. A... Actually, Jan could probably do a job, couldn't he? He's six foot nine or whatever. Does, does anybody have their Peter Shell as their number? He's been keeping himself on good nick. Uh, True, like I, saw, yeah. I saw him on his Instagram. I message him and pretend we want a personal trainer and actually then go, <laughs> but actually we want a new centre-back, big man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk with a contract, just get him to sign the bottom. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must say, though, like, like, you know, as you said, Gary, like... Uh, it's not nice to see that kind of stuff when it's like, like it looked like almost like he was kind of holding like his, his, his ankle or something. It was kind of a weird one because nobody was around him. I felt like he kind of it looked like he slipped and maybe like he pulled something that way, maybe. But mm. um, it's just he's a really nice guy. We have played him quite a lot. It was probably more minutes than what he thought he was going to get, which probably didn't help because you know with Dan being out you kind of had to play right so um it's just it was just for such a great game and I'm not trying to be negative but you know we kind of it, it's just error luck sometimes that we kind of end up with like a, a couple of players having to go off and stuff like that well, but um that's what, a, that's what a buddy of mine said like we can't have joy without and no pun intended pain like that's just the wanderer's way it seems like even last year with all the joy that last game was literally the needle in that balloon because everything we saw all year was happening. It, the ball just didn't cross the line. You know, this week the ball crossed the line four times. Tremendous season, best of the season performances by so many players. Like you said, Anthony, four players in the team of the week. But here we are, uh, Julian, Zach, uh, Jeremy, Ferrazzo, they all took visible knocks. So – you know, how does that look in the short term and in Dunn's case, especially long term? Um, I'm not religious in any sense, but I swear I had a prayer for him. I really, really did because it didn't um, look good. Well, well, we'll have to ask uh, Josh. He usually has the inside track on this kind of stuff. I feel like he just hangs around like outside the, uh, the treatment center or the, the hospital just finding out what's going on. He's uh, he's awesome what he does. So, yeah. So, uh, Gary, I did want to uh, I know you like a. Uh, a deep dive into stuff. So I thought this would be a good little thing for you. So, you know, Patrice kind of mentioned um, after the last game against Forge that we had like five good games of, uh, five good halves of football. This makes seven good halves of football. So, you know, we were kind of tinkering around a little bit. Um, so what's, what's changed that we're starting to, to see the team kind of gel a little bit. Like we obviously were unbeaten in four or f- five games now, wherever it is. So what's changed? Like, is he still tinkering or are we kind of res- resorted back to what the players know best or where do we go wrong? Where do we go right? And where are we right now? I think we've reverted back to a way of playing that we saw last season. And I think it's a way of playing that Patrice has played for the past five, six, seven years with, with Vaughan as well. It's what he knows best. And, in terms of the profiles of players we've got, I think they're they're far more suited to playing a four two three one than they were a three four three. I liked I liked that we did try the move towards a true three at the back at the start of the season. I liked that that was trialed because you cannot stay static in football. You just can't because you get figured out. But I feel like. We changed, and again, I we, we've talked about this on the pod. I think it was quite superficial. A lot of the ways we did change, moving to the three four three, it wasn't it wasn't a wholesale change, but it, in the details, there was just enough of a change for it to unsettle a few of the players. And I'm thinking of I'm thinking of, of the defensive unit when I say that because they suddenly went from being a back four who became a compact back three to being a back three who had a lot of space to cover. And I don't think Dan and I don't think Kale ever looked entirely comfortable having all of that space either side of them to cover. Julian was Ju- Julian was fine, cent- cent- central centre back standing in the middle, no problem. But Kale having to pull really far left, 
Dan having to pull really far right without the security of having your fullbacks who would get back really quickly and tuck in. And we never quite figured that out. We we conceded a lot of goals from cutback earlier in cutbacks earlier in the season. And I think even Gonzalez, the Ottawa coach, kind of alluded to that in a post-match press conference, how we were vulnerable there. So we've fixed it. We've fixed it by going back to the 4-2-3-1. We look a lot more defensively solid. Um and in terms of like you mentioned the past five games there, like in terms of underlying numbers, w- we've been a top two, three, four team for about a month now, maybe longer. And I know I can hear or see the collective eye roll because I know there is still a lot of skepticism towards um, XG and those sorts of metrics and underlying metrics in 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 football. I'm not a skeptic. I, I do think they have value. I think you need to judge them over an entire season though. But what I will say is XG differential. And what I mean by that is the difference between XG, which is expected goals and XG conceded. The difference between those two numbers is a massively reliable indicator of long-term performance and long-term success. If you look at the Premier League table from last season, apart from the middle of the table where it's there's a lot of little variances the best teams had by far the biggest xg differential because they are the teams that create the most chances and they are the teams that do not concede many chances and we were right up there i mean we have we have still the best expected goals in the league um and I, I genuinely think that means something because it tells you how many chances we're creating maybe strikers aren't finishing but that's nothing that's nothing to do with the coaches or the the system that's strikers being off form so you can read into those numbers i really believe that and i'm finally the results are starting to come now because that's four without a defeat really good win and and it just feels like we've turned a corner yeah it's it's, uh, totally and i think you can you can just see that everybody looks a lot more comfortable like you know there was a couple of games you could see players getting frustrated you know the exact just didn't see himself uh he kind of talks a little bit about it on the pod and stuff like that and you know he looks happier Everybody looks kind of happier. They all kind of know what their roles are because they're used to it, right? I mean, like when you, like, it's kind of a big thing we made about that we haven't actually changed the team an awful lot from like last year. And when it was, that system was drilled into your head last year, and then suddenly it's like, we're going to take all that away and just try and do something a little bit different. It kind of does football. I, you said it before, Gary, and I'm surprised that none of the, uh, none of the team has actually like gave you a slap, but like I said, that footballers are kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> not, no, not just not just wondrous footballers like every footballer i've ever met has been dull as fuck to be honest blood out of a stone to have a chat with them all right mate how you been you've been all right yeah, you know uh, training all with the boys and you know anyway. yeah uh, so yeah so you know like overall um things are set, uh, certainly on the up and up we were kind of I think a lot of people were kind of worried that uh, that was the season done. Like we were kind of like uh, without a win and nine, but th- after beating Vancouver, definitely doesn't feel as doomy and gloomy. But Chris, I uh, kind of want to get your thoughts. Um, so Vancouver themselves, like I, I thought this probably, like, I watched them a couple of times. It was probably the worst game I've ever seen them play. They were absolutely dreadful. Uh, nobody, nobody was up for it. They just looked lethargic. Was it maybe that trip to Kelowna was uh, took a lot more out than we saw? Um, and I, you know, you they went from all the hustle and bustle of six and a half thousand fans at the Apple Bowl and all that kind of stuff, coming back to like the like probably what two thousand, two and a half thousand people there. Um, it, just, it just didn't look like a happy camp. Uh, what were your thoughts on it, Chris? It doesn't look like it. It doesn't sound like it. And as we saw on the weekend, it doesn't really feel like it either. Um, you know, preseason Gary was ahead of the curb in witnessing and, and kind of realizing that Vancouver did some proper business and actually has something to show. And they followed through. Um, but, you know, you 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 can read between the lines. You see players that aren't playing that played a lot last year. You see players getting released um, as the registration window closes. You see players getting subbed off in the 31st minute who are 17 years old, who really didn't do anything wrong, but were embarrassed as a result. And I can go on for an hour about how absolutely awful that substitution was, even though Vancouver improved on the field after. And that's the type of manager that Gottby is. It's what happens on the field, not off. But 
I think a lot of what's been happening off the field with Vancouver, I think, is now beginning to seep on the field. Uh, it begins tactically and structurally. It's no secret that Gottby is more of a preacher and less of a shower. Um, training sessions aren't necessary late in, in match preparation. And we kind of got a glimpse of that in this last press conference. I, I forget who what was it. Was it Garcia or uh, the press conference? Uh, Romero. Yeah, it was yeah. Romero. Pardon me. It's terrible of me. Um, but yeah, like that's probably the most vocal and revealing, I suppose, um, term publicly about what's going on in Vancouver. Results will mask everything. It doesn't matter it, what's going on off the field if on the field things are clicking. And I think that what's happened in Vancouver so far this year is they've kind of surprised their own fans. They've surprised the market. They've surprised the league. Um, Gary has gone in depth about their tactical structures over the over the months. And the way they used to play, they've completely abandoned, it seems. Um, that quick transition play is gone. You see guys playing out of position. And I think that was... You know, Gary was talking about it earlier. Telford was fine in the six. You know, there's six. I forget his name, but he's typically a center back. And he's, you know, looked like a, a chicken with his head cut off. Um, you know, the center backs just seem to let us find those lanes in the middle. Tactically, it just seems in disarray. And then off the field, like you said, Anthony, the energy at the club through the fans, we've seen it on Twitter. Reddit is scathing. I think they're a little more liberal on Reddit with what they want to say about the club. Um, the Kelowna thing has left and I think will leave a short to midterm um, bad taste in these supporters mouths. You know, on one hand, a game was taken away from them. So your actual physical, tangible investment in the club taken away. And then the return offer essentially being you can get a ticket to a game that you already have a ticket to. So like you're treating somebody else to a game that you know there's no benefit for you as a supporter for investing your money and then seeing the club go treat another market so those two things when those things come together we haven't seen that in Halifax I feel like the bad juju in Halifax has mostly always come from what's happening on the field I think us as a supporter group we're there through thick and thin so off the field it looks like we're still there it looks even though we know from what we read online, it's not necessarily there. Other markets, they think that it's all hunky-dory out here, regardless of how bad we're playing. In Vancouver, it's not like that. So I think that it's a, a melting pot, I think, of all the negatives. The little negatives are all starting to become a bigger thing. And, and I think visually, that 31st-minute substitution for Tahid, down 2 nil, the system changes again. So again, the players aren't getting prepared enough. Then you're making a mid-match change tactically that they're not prepared for. Second half, nothing really generally changes. Like there was some pressure, but it was individual skill. It was players actually using their raw talents, I think, to try to get Vancouver over the hump. It just feels like the buy-in from the first few weeks is starting to drift away. So it'll be curious next time we play them how close we are in the table because, yeah, we're still in last, but you can see the light at the end of the tunnel – not just in how good we're playing, but you can see the 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 ball starting to roll down the hill for a few of these other clubs. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, I, uh, it's it's going to be interesting. Like I mean, like Valor kind of had that that, that spell when they were doing quite well, and then they've kind of like dropped off. Uh, Vancouver definitely catchable. So it's it's going to be interesting to see. Like you've seen, obviously the new manager bounce for York. They've kind of like uh, been playing really well and. Uh, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a fascinating season, and I just I just hope we haven't left it too late to get ourselves in gear. So, uh, Gary, I want to uh, ask you, uh, our uh, intrepid reporter, uh, about your article on one soccer. Congratulations! It was a fantastic read. Um, I hope they paid you well for it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not joking. Uh, and you declared it on your taxes. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just kind of wanted to to, to ask you because I think it's a, I, I mentioned it, um before about what a great initiative it is. I just want to know how you kind of got involved, like how they reached out to you, um, why you chose to do the topic you did, <laughs> and what did what did you learn anything new for us in terms of the stadium and uh, what's what's happened with the whole thing. 
Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't choose the topic actually. Um, so oh, wow. when, when, when they announced the initiative, which again is a fantastic initiative because, um, like I'm, I'm fortunate enough to work full time, but there are people who are dedicated sports journalists, and there are not many paid jobs in this country or anywhere really for sports journalists. So, for one soccer who's their mandate is to grow the game in the country, for them to actually put their money where their mouth is by paying people to write about football is wonderful and something personally I never thought I'd be able to do. It was always just a hobby. So um, yeah, it feels like six years of writing about the league has finally paid <laughs> off almost. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I didn't, it didn't come up with the idea. So when Armin first put the tweet out about it, I emailed him a load of my own ideas, which I thought were very good ideas. And he, he just kind of went, uh, how about we do, you can write something about the stadium proposal instead. Um, which was a little bit out of my comfort zone, to be honest, because, um, I am when it comes to Canada anyway, I am, I am politically asexual when it comes to Canadian politics. I just read about UK politics still. I don't know why I just, that's what I read about and what I pay attention to, which Maybe because I'm I'm a permanent resident, I, not a citizen, so I can't yeah, I, here. So I, I do the exact same thing. Like I, yeah, I, I try not to make my opinion because I can't vote here. I'm not a permanent. Yeah, resident exactly. Here, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So go ahead. Um, yeah, so I was a bit intimidated by that because I knew there was like a polit- political and financial angle to it, and I I don't think I have a particularly good grasp of that sort of thing. Just. I just, I don't know. I've never really been able to get my head around finances and funding and blah, blah, blah. Um, But luckily the people I spoke to were kind of, they put it to me in layman's terms. Um, Derek's always really engaging and very easy to talk to, very open with his time. James Covey, the same. Mayor, interesting talking to him. Um, He sounded absolutely knackered for the first 10 seconds, but he soon woke up. (laughs) <laughs> um and nice 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 enough guy as well and i was surprised how easy it was to get an appointment with him to be honest i thought there'd be a lot of hoops to jump through so yeah I'm pretty pretty happy with how it came out not my favorite thing i've ever done um i think and this is through no fault of one soccer i think this is just my own internal thing like i think i kind of I, I compromised on on like how I normally like to write a little bit because I was conscious of the fact that it was obviously reaching a wider market and it had to have like um, a degree of professionalism about it where normally I just go off on tangents and write stupid shit just because I find it funny. So I knew I couldn't do that. I had to like keep it quite tight. Um, but yeah, I think it seemed to get a pretty good reception. So hopefully hopefully they they ignore my pitches and tell me what to write about again in the future uh go ahead chris you go for no real quick i just wanted to say gary like you've provided a service in a way that it doesn't matter what we as fans can do and say and try to describe and explain what's going on in our city and with our club and and with this stadium to fans in other markets they don't quite get it and you did an incredible job creating this piece that now fans from other markets can or we can reference to fans in other markets to explain it and break it down a lot better. They actually hear the voices of, like you said, people like James who aside from Derek have been here from day one and the mayor who is outgoing, who, you know, from the article and even from talking to Mike, you almost feel like he wanted one more year to see this over the line. It's just the way things have been structured and the way things go. It would be cruel of him to take that extra year only to step down and have another election in 365 days. So I'm just giving you kudos and and commending the piece because it's going to be an important piece for us to reference to other supporters in the hopefully not too distant future, but for, for time. Thanks, yeah. I mean, like, like most men I know, I have absolutely no idea how to deal with compliments, but I do appreciate it. And yeah, yeah what, what the mayor said about it, that it was his big regret from, from his time as I don't think he said big regret, but it was a regret from his time as mayor that he didn't get it over the line, which shows you how much he feels about it. Yeah, like I, I, I was gonna say try and compliment you too, but Chris like just nailed this so well done, bud. There we go. That's as far as yeah, it'll go. Yeah. yeah, so you don't feel too awkward. No, but I'm sorry, but, Anthony, don't no, no, let me cut you off anymore, bro. Just no, 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 no but it's like well, I, I couldn't have put on any better to be air for to be perfectly honest, but I actually think it's one of your, the, the best things you've written, just in the, in the, because I know, 
I know how you like to write, and you kind of you, like you, there's always like funny like little uh, pop culture references in there and all that kind of stuff. And I know it must have been difficult for you to try and not do that, and especially as well with a topic that you didn't choose, which is amazing that you know you kind of went full tilt with it. And um, I just also love the fact that Derek was late again. He's always fucking late. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I nearly. I was messing you boys, wasn't I? I was like, I was like, it's about forty minutes late now. I might go home in a minute. <laughs> He's forgotten. I hope he fucking paid for lunch after being late. <laughs> he did. He did. To be fair to him, he yeah. did buy lunch. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So I, I think uh, the the Wanderers uh, train is back on the tracks. Uh, I think everybody seemed to be happy and uh, uh, are looking forward to the game on Monday. Uh, are you guys going to go on the the ship? Uh, the the pre match ship thing that they're doing, not this no. first, not the, not the first one. I got little man. Yeah, you know, mm. it would actually be fun to bring him there, but it seems like it's going to be more of a adult beverage party atmosphere. So maybe yeah. the next one, maybe the next one. I'm not drinking at games this season, so not for me either. That's Gary stand again. See, see how long that lasts for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, you know, there's uh, I, I can definitely just see if it's going to be a scorching hot day. I can see you like cracking open the, the beer. Uh, I feel like now everyone that listens to this, uh, if they see me with a beer in the stadium now, they're going to be like, oh, full of oh shit. please, please, please. If anybody sees Gary with a beer at a game, take a picture and tag us in it because uh, I'd love to see that. Um, yeah, um, I. I I did want to uh, just do a little bit of a rant because uh, I did post about it and I, I know you probably don't want to listen to it, but the patio thing really pissed me off. Uh, oh, go it, on, man. Go on. I know. Go no, on, but, rant, but, rant away, brother. No, rant I, I, away. I, I, I won't. I won't. <laughs> but, like, you know, uh, the game was like, it was pissing rain at the at the game against Forge. Uh, we were lucky enough that uh, Chris's mom got like a, a box and was kind enough to invite me and my, my buds up there, so we was really appreciate that. Um, but we would have been after the patio, and I actually went down to the patio to meet my friends before I saw Chris and stuff. And I noticed there was like a, a barrier down the middle of it. Now, the reason why a lot of people stand at the um, the, the patio is because you can kind of line across the hoarding, so you, you can see the game up close and whatever that. And it's part of the atmosphere of it, it's that like everybody's kind of spaced out and. There's like a couple of like little bars along the way there, and then there's toilets at the back there. So we, we all have our like little set routines, and then there's barriers there. Uh, I went up to the guys like, "What's going on here?" He's like, "Oh, it's there's a a corporate event. Uh, Deloitte have rented half of the patio, which you know, I don't understand why they're doing that. Like people have paid their ticket for the patio. I get at the back there now, like where the the umbrellas are. People with patio tickets can't use them anymore because they're like corporate." things which is ridiculous to me but anyway like i i accept that but now like they've taken away half the patio to to rent out to somebody else and when we looked over like you know we had like i looked over and there was like people like and the crowd wasn't that big obviously because of the rain it was like it was five or six deep you know and like the reason why i i, I picked that ticket is because i like being at the hoarding and like right by the game and i i would have been pissed off if i had been over there and being like the person at the back might be able to see the game probably because you know we, because it was such a bad day there was like 20 people i think in the the light thing that they'd rented out and it's not the life solved right the club is obviously trying to make more money but i just think is it was a very bad taste in my mouth and uh, i was not not happy seeing that kind of stuff and you know I, I hope that they don't do it again but i feel like they might and uh i'd be upset if they do it again because i think there's I know that it's a business, but at the same time, though, like a season ticket isn't cheap either, especially with the way, like, how much it costs to go to the game and the cost of the beer, blah, 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 and the lack of facilities and that, and that. And you're taking away little bits and pieces every time. You're just taken away from um, the enjoyment of the football, which is what the main reason we're there for. So that's my little rant over, and I hope they reconsider cutting off half the patio and giving it to a corporate um, entity. So. Plus, I think what you guys have done, you know, um, we do our thing in 104, kitchen, uh, privateers, 108, 109. The patio has become one of those subsections now. I've said it to you. I've said it to all you guys that are standing down there. All the credit in the world. Even people that are there for their first game, they get into it. They're banging on the end board during yeah. the corner kick. They're booing. They're, you guys have become, I, like, you know, we'll say the kitchen's the heartbeat. And maybe 104 is the, the, the carcass because we're the grandstand. But you guys have become like the veins. You guys are literally 
closer than we are to the pitch. You're basically breathing on these guys and coast to coast, club to club, player to player. There's probably a story for every single one of these guys when it comes to Halifax. And those stories aren't interactions with the fans in the kitchen or aren't interactions with the fans in 104. It's interactions with the fans in the patio. So, yeah. you know, I was upset for you guys because it's almost like, you know, and, and again, club making money. I hope Derek got a lot out of it. <laughs> um, but like, you, you're not going to take away half of 104. You're not going to book the kitchen. I think the patio, what you guys have done, you've earned that trust and that respect from your fellow fan base. But I think also from people on the outside looking in that I don't think that should ever be considered again in that kind of entity. Like you guys have made that space yours. You guys have made that space a part of the stadium's breath. So I, I kind of felt for you guys for sure, because um, you said it like what you've created is because you, you've got your routine, that elbow room, that space you can see over people when you're not six, seven, eight deep. Yeah, I definitely empathize with you guys, and I hope that uh, it's figured out. Yeah, I just, you know, I, um, because, like, as you said, it's a big part of it, like, the people banging on the hoard and all that kind of stuff, and somebody's going to take a, a free kick, or the one just has done something well, that kind of stuff, and, you know, I, I, I kind of mentioned there a couple of weeks ago, when we were playing Calgary, the goalkeeper is, like, unknown from everything, and there were people were chirping them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was like Liverpool fans and Everton fans. Blah, blah, blah. And it, I, I just feel like it's going to take away from that um, just to kind of make some extra dollars. And it's like, I, I just think that it's like, they're looking at where can we, cu- where can we cut something um, and not cause the least amounts of fuss? Let's go with the, the, the section where the blow-ins go in. But the thing is, like I, I pay for my season ticket and, you know, it's uncomfortable enough because you're standing it, it was raining. It's muddy. It's 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 not the greatest place to be, but I love it because I'm right on top of the goal and I can see everything. I can hear everything, and you can see you've got a good panoramic view of the stadium from where we are too. And then you know they're kind of just trying to change that, and I just saw I'd bring it up. So sorry for my rant. Uh, I didn't mean to put a negative spin on must be an amazing an amazing few days for us, but uh, you know onwards and upwards. Uh, we've got a big game on Monday. Uh, Gary, I know you've done the opposition corner, so let's go with that. Uh, do you know I've done that? I wasn't aware I've done that. Who we got? Cavalry, right? <laughs> I'm joking. I was just I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm sorry. When you were talking about where you and Chris were sitting during the game, I'm surprised you didn't mention my little phone packet, my little phone in all <laughs> but... I was trying to be nice. I was trying to not bring it up. I, didn't, I don't think anybody needs to know about you and your little uh, your little pouch. Little plastic <laughs> wallet. <laughs> it's funny, it's like, but a buddy you know... of mine said that when he's listening to music in the shower, he does that. Does... And, then, and then another buddy of mine says on the construction site, everybody does it. I've never seen it before until you did it, Gary. One of the funniest things I've ever seen. Yeah. Gary, were, were you two just staring at me while I, when I took it out? Is that what happened? No. So like, we, where we like, well, we were just like over the bench and we were kind of looking across. And every, uh, it's funny. Like whenever I'm like in the press box or around that section, if I happen to be like very rarely that I ever get a chance to be in the box, I always kind of look to see where you are because I always think I, I was because you got like, your little perch at the top of <laughs> one hundred four, and I, I just think I, I think it's hilarious that like you're. Just watching the game and like just, I just all this stuff has gone through your head. And we kind of looked over and I kind of zoomed in on my phone and we found you. I think I sent you the picture. <laughs> you, look like, you look like a hooligan, which is awesome. But then yeah. uh, the, the, the plastic, uh, the, was it a Ziploc bag or did you actually? Yeah, a little, little sandwich bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with my phone getting wet, mate. It's pissing it down. It's, such, it's so genius, man. I've never <laughs> like my buddy said. He's like, "Why is it such a big deal?" I was like, "I've never seen this before." He says, "You've never worked construction." He says, "The construction sites when it's raining, literally somebody will show up with a hundred bag of Ziploc bags and just start handing them out to the boys for their." Phone. Okay, so so the, the the notebook guys have got their sponsorship at Garrison. We need a sponsorship from Ziploc. <laughs> yeah, that'll be it. if there's like a Nova Scotia company that makes a local version of it, that would be fantastic. Oh, God. Um, be- before we finish, can I can I just crowdsource something from people listening? So we were we were chatting, weren't we? Us three 
And we were kind of having a joke about this, but I feel like we should seriously ask people. So an idea for a spin-off podcast during the off season, down the pub investigates. Oh. These are our work, these are our working ideas, but we want other people's ideas as well. So episode one would be um our no nay versus Langwa, the inside story of the feud that shook Halifax. Episode yeah. two, um, the mysterious case of Abdulaziz. Who is he? Where is he? What is he? Um is he real? I have my doubts. Um, episode three, smuggling beer into the island games, um, featuring a, a certain German with a fake voice box, probably. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'll take that back. That's, that's libelous. Um, and episode four, what did we think of a fourth one? Uh, we, 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 I'm sure we probably did, but uh, yeah. Uh, I think... If pe- people can think of ideas, fantastic. Oh, down down uh, the pub investigates. That's how we're going to spend the off season this year. Uh Pereira's broken arm. Pereira's broken arm, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah what yeah. happened that night? How did he end up in hospital? What broke his arm? <laughs> Why did he think making an Instagram story about it was a good idea when we had a match the next day? All these questions to be answered. Yeah. So ideas in, please. I love that idea. Yeah, uh, down the pub investigates. Um, come, to this, come, to this, come to a podcast soon. Uh, lads, it's, it's so nice to be able to have a little bit of... Uh, lightheartedness after the kind of crazy season we've had so far i feel like it's just deja vu but uh it just feels awesome um congrats to the lads it is amazing uh yeah so um lads awesome appreciate it uh talk to you soon Get out!